Hello, we're going to talk today about the neurological complications of ATTR amyloidosis. This is the outline. We're going to first talk a little bit about the neurological systems. We're going to discuss how amyloid damages the nerve, the neurological signs of ATTR amyloidosis, and how do you detect and make the diagnosis of ATTR amyloid neuropathy. First, let's start with the overview of the neurological system. The neurological system is divided into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system is once the nerve leaves the spinal cord and go down to the neuromuscular junction and the muscle. There's also a very important uh, neurological system called the autonomic nervous system that control the bladder, the bowel, the blood pressure, the heart rate, and so forth. And this is also divided into central and peripheral. The ATTR amyloidosis mainly affect the peripheral nervous system, but can also affect the central nervous system. What happens with nerve damage? There's two types of nerve damage. There's the demyelinating nerve damage, and there's the axonal nerve damage. With amyloid, we're dealing mainly with axonal nerve damage. So when you do your nerve conduction study and biopsies, you're going to find an axonal neuropathy rather than a demyelinating neuropathy. Obviously, that will affect nerve recovery after treatment. It's not as perfect as with demyelinating neuropathy where nerve regeneration uh, can be better. How about the nerve damage in amyloidosis? First, let's talk about this disease, how it starts. You have the transthyretin protein, which transport uh, thyroxin and retinol, meaning vitamin A. It's mainly produced by the liver, but can also be produced in the brain and choroid plexus in the eye and by other organs, giving you local production. What happened in, in a patient who have ATTR amyloidosis is that protein, uh, which is usually in natural state, a tetramel, will fold and misfold and aggregates and give you beta pleated sheets and makes the amyloid. And that by itself will cause nerve damage, heart damage, and other organ damage. The amyloid can deposit in the nerve, as you can see here. It can be probably toxic to the nerve as well before even depositing. Um, it can deposit in blood vessel as well, interrupting blood flow and closing, uh, causing a, a fragile blood vessel that can uh, bleed. It does come in two flavors. Uh, there's the hereditary condition uh, where patient has inherited a gene variant that is pathogenic from their mother or father, and sometimes, unfortunately, from both. And there's the wild type that happens as people get older. And wild type is uh, mainly causing heart disease, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, and spinal stenosis. What about the neurological signs of HATTR amyloidosis? Uh, the neuropathy is typically a length dependent, meaning that uh, the distal part of the limb, mainly the feet, starts at the feet. And as the disease progresses, it's going to uh, move uh, more uh, proximally, involving the ankles and the calf and then the knees and then eventually the hands at some point. It is symmetric. Both sides are affected to a similar degree. It affects both sensory and motor nerves. And uh, unfortunately, it's a progressive neuropathy unless obviously treated. What are these symptoms uh, with the sensory symptoms are numbness, burning, prickling sensation, pain to light touch, balance difficulties, and so forth. With the motor symptoms, you're going to have weakness, tripping on the feet, and difficulty standing on your tiptoes. And of course, the dysautonomia, which is very common in amyloidosis. How do we diagnose neuropathy? Usually you have two or more of the following. You have the symptoms. So the patient comes with numbness, tingling, burning pain in the hands and feet. And when you examine the patient, you see that their reflexes are, uh, are uh, reduced or absent. They have loss of sensation uh, in a stock and glove distribution. And then you can do a nerve conduction study uh, that shows and demonstrate the, the neuropathy. Uh, in certain occasions, you can also do a skin biopsy or nerve biopsy or quantitative sensory testing. In the autonomic dysfunction, people, uh, men will have erectile dysfunction. This is actually one of the first signs of uh, amyloidosis. Uh, they can have severe diarrhea, incontinence, constipation. People can stay at home because of these problems. They cannot go on a long trip because they need to be 
close to a bathroom. Uh, they can get early satiety, nausea, a regurgitation of indigested food, and as a result of all of this, weight loss, orthostatic hypertension and heat intolerance. Orthostatic hypertension is a major issue because people can lose consciousness when they stand up and faint and even injure themselves when they fall. And the symptoms of that are lightheadedness, syncope and presyncope, dimming of the vision, confusion, neck and shoulder pain. They have like a coat hanger, headache, chest pain, shortness of breath, and fatigue on exertion. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a common manifestation of amyloidosis and can be the first presenting symptoms in about 50% of these patients in this study that we did. Uh, about 50% of people with HATTR amyloidosis came with carpal tunnel syndrome. What is important is a lot of them at the time of carpal tunnel syndrome also had GI issues, uh, dysautonomia, neuropathy, or heart disease. So always ask the patient with carpal tunnel syndrome if they have any of those symptoms as well, which would raise the suspicion for amyloidosis. Remember, carpal tunnel syndrome is common in the general population and in diabetic and hereditary neuropathy. So it's not necessarily an indication of amyloidosis, but if you have a bilateral progressive resistant to treatment uh, carpal tunnel syndrome with associated manifestation of other organs involvement, uh, you're gonna think about amyloidosis. Spinal stenosis is another common issue in ATTR amyloidosis. You have the position of the amyloid in the connective tissue and in the ligamentum flavum, which will compress uh, the nerve at the spinal cord level. Amyloid can also be deposited in the eye, and people can present to you with floaters that uh, affect the vision. If you remove those and stain them for Congo red, they'll stain for Congo red. They can also have glaucoma, cataracts, dry eyes, and, uh, and other problems with uh, the amyloidosis. Amyloid can deposit in blood vessel and in the brain. It can cause bleeding and leptomeningeal infiltration. So you have to look at those. And as we treat people uh, with our TTR silencer, which mainly target the liver at this time, and if you follow people long enough, you may have more and more CNS manifestation. You can actually demonstrate that with uh, brain imaging and PET scans of the brain and demonstrate that there's amyloid deposition in there. How do we detect the amyloid? Um, there's a biopsy is the classical way to detect the amyloid. You can biopsy the nerve, you can do a fat aspirate, you can biopsy the muscle uh, or nerve and muscle. We do them at the same time uh, because it, with one incision, it's easy to do that. You can also do other type of biopsy, salivary glands, skin biopsy, rectal biopsy, uh, or any type of uh, on GI endoscopy. Um, or even the carpal tunnel syndrome, if the patient is having a release, you can uh, look at uh, send the tissue for Congo staining. In addition, you can do a PET scan of the heart, uh, PYP scan, which will demonstrate amyloid deposition. And if the patient doesn't have a monoclonal gammopathy, uh, then you can consider this as a positive sign of amyloidosis without necessarily undergoing a biopsy. There's many challenges in the amyloidosis. This is a rare disease, so a lot of patients can get misdiagnosed. Um, and it's very common, maybe in about 50% or more, they get a different diagnosis initially. And they can be diagnosed with peripheral neuropathy from other causes, usually idiopathic or diabetic. Um, they can be diagnosed with CIDP, ALS, fibromyalgia, and so forth. So. Uh, be careful with those, especially if the patient has severe autonomic dysfunction, uh, they continue to progress despite treatment, and they have evidence of multi-organ failure, then you're going to think about amyloidosis. This is just a progression of the neuropathy and other idiopathic or CMT. You can see these neuropathies every year. You examine them. They're about the same or slightly worse, whereas in HATTR amyloidosis neuropathy, the neuropathy progresses at a much faster rate. Other challenges is that patient uh, can have the variant, especially now with family screening, uh, but not necessarily have uh, amyloidosis yet. So we don't start these people on treatment. Remember that biopsies can have false negative and false positive as well. So if you have high suspicion, you may need to do more than one biopsy. 
Very briefly, I will address treatment strategies for ATTR amyloidosis. Now there are treatment that actually specifically target the TTR. They can decrease mortality, decrease morbidity, and even improve the neuropathy and the heart failure. So it's very important to make this diagnosis because you're going to uh, significantly improve your patient uh, lifespan and quality of life. We can also treat the symptoms themselves, such as the diarrhea, hypotension, and edema, and so forth. So thank you very much for listening. I hope this will raise awareness about amyloidosis and ATTR neuropathy.